Purchase Sunday School class. I'm so excited to see everyone here this morning. It's always a pleasure to come before you and have the opportunity to share the Word of God. And so uh, I just appreciate your prayers during this time. We want to see God do great and mighty things this morning, don't we? Well, praise the Lord. If you'd like to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7, verses 13, we're going to consider verses 13 through 23 this morning. And as you're doing that, let's go to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Most loving, kind, and gracious Heavenly Father, we come into your presence right now, Lord, with just eager anticipation for what it is that you're going to do in our hearts and lives. And Father, in preparation for that, we do want to pause for just a moment to take the opportunity to once again consider 1 John 1, 9, which tells us that if we confess our sin, that you're faithful and righteous to forgive us of all sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so, Father, we're so very grateful for this passage, which, of course, has nothing whatsoever to do with our salvation, but certainly has everything to do with the middle tense of our salvation, which is our maturity in Christ. So, Father, we're going to pause just now to take care of our personal business. Father, thank you again for the wonderful provisions that you make in your word. Lord, we do thank you for the teaching this morning, and it is my earnest prayer, as always, Father, that I might be set aside so that the Holy Spirit might have free reign, free course, to use me as he will, because, Father, I bring nothing good to the table. It's only you, Lord. It's all about you. So, Father, please speak through me. Speak to your people. May we all hear from you today and... uh, Find that we're growing because of that. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, once again, we're turning to Matthew chapter 7, uh, verses uh, 13 through 23. And as always, we like to take a moment to review our purpose, plan, and objective. And you're very familiar with these, but I just do feel like it's so very important for us to review this material. For one reason, there's generally pretty good break between the time that I get up to pick up on the course, but it's just good to be reminded. In fact, this is something that we should probably remind ourselves of each and every day. So what are we doing? We're comparing and contrasting the law of Moses with grace. And the reason we're doing this is because we want to have a proper understanding of these very important themes, but most importantly, how they're related to the life of the New Testament believer. I point you again to Schofield's comment here, which he says, we have most of us been reared and now live under the influence of Galatianism. Protestant theology, alas, is for the most part thoroughly Galatianized, he says, in that neither law nor grace are given their distinct and separated places as in the councils of God, but are mingled together in one incoherent system. He goes on to say, the law is no longer, as in the divine intent, a ministration of death or of cursing or of conviction. Because we are taught that we must, as believers now, he's saying, we must try to keep the Mosaic law and that by divine help we may. He goes on to say, nor on the other hand does grace being as blessed deliverance from the dominion of sin... Uh, or does it bring blessed deliverance from the dominion of sin? For we are kept under the law as a rule of life, despite the plain declaration, sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. And William Newell reiterates this, saying, It is because Reformed theology has kept us Gentiles under the law, if not as a means of righteousness, then as a rule of life, that all the trouble has arisen. The law is no more a rule of life than it is a means of righteousness. Walking in the Spirit has now taken the place of walking by ordinances. God has another principle under which he, which he has put his saints. And here we again, repeating this passage. You are not under law, but under grace. And then Henry Ironside speaking about this in Romans 8, 1, where it says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. It says in Romans chapter 7, we have a man renewed by the Spirit, but struggling under law. 
hoping thereby to subdue or find deliverance from the power of the old Adamic nature. In chapter 8, we have God's only way of deliverance through the death and resurrection of Christ with which the believer is identified before God. The chapter begins with no condemnation and ends with no separation. All who are in Christ Jesus. Is anyone in here in Christ Jesus? If you are, pay close attention. You are accepted in the beloved and as free from every charge of guilt as he is himself. He, that is Jesus, paid our penalty on the cross. Now we are linked up with him in resurrection, not under the law, but under grace. That's what we're doing in trying to teach these, this series, is make sure we understand that we are not under the law. Because it is so easy, and we do it all the time, we go back to the law. We forget. So it's important. Now, why are we in Matthew? Well, because Matthew is all about Jesus speaking to the Jews who are at that time under the law. Matthew has three purposes here. He's going to explain that Jesus, in whom Matthew's Israelite audience had believed, these were believing Jews, was indeed the long-awaited Jewish Messiah. He's also writing this because he wants them to understand that the promised messianic kingdom has been postponed despite the fact that the king had arrived. And three, the, the interim program of God during the messianic kingdom while the king is absent is something that was new information and they needed to understand that. All right, so let's just very quickly review lesson uh, session 36. So here we are. This was Matthew 7, 1 and 2. Jesus there tells the Israel, his Israelite audience that they are not to judge. Then he says that, that they, to the extent that they do judge, and in the manner that they judge, they themselves will be judged. Then in, uh, he continues and he says that it's important how you judge if you're going to judge because he's looking for a particular quality. And we see that in John 7, which is a reiteration of Deuteronomy 16, 18. Do not judge according to appearance. Judge with righteous judgment. And so that's what Jesus is addressing here. Then he goes on and says that uh, Jesus gives a warning about the superficiality of judging according to the flesh because from a human viewpoint, all of our judgment is influenced by, well, gee, let's see, what, what might influence our judgment? Anger, envy, hatred, ignorance, jealousy, selfish ambition. The principle of judging oneself, however... Uh, which is revealed under the law, as we say here, is also valid under grace because we see in 1 Corinthians 11.31 says, if we judged ourselves and if we did so rightly, we would not be judged. I like this passage. It's very important because it tells me that instead of being concerned with judging others, I need to hold the mirror up in front of my face and judge myself. Very important, isn't it? It's very easy to judge others, by the way, isn't it? Uh, what is God's intention in telling them, Jesus telling them to ask, seek, and knock? Well, it's God's intention, and again, speaking to the Israelites there, He's encouraging them and us to come to Him in faith because He is a benevolent God. He's a benevolent God. He's kind. Aren't you so glad that God is kind? I tell you what, I don't know, we, we could just do a whole series of sessions on the kindness of God, isn't that right? So he says, ask, seek, and knock, but now when we start thinking about that from the standpoint of the believer, we have an even better scenario than they had because believers have VIP privilege, privilege access to God. Because we're told that we can come boldly to the throne of grace, aren't we? Can't we? Isn't that wonderful? I just love that. How many times do we not come to God boldly because we allow the enemy to condemn us? Jesus then takes them into what we call the golden rule in, chapter, in lesson 36. He takes his Israelite audience once again back to the law of Moses, 
which declares that the Israelite is to love his neighbor as himself. And that's an important thing, isn't it also? Uh, Why is that important? Because you will recall we talked about the fact that there was actually a sect of Judaism called the Essenes who taught just the opposite. They said, hate everybody, pretty much. If you're not an Essene, if you're not a member of our group, hate everyone else and do whatever it takes to wipe them out. Uh, This was at the time that Jesus was walking on the planet. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, you shall love your neighbor as yourself because God says, I am the Lord. Uh, Loving one's neighbor also applies to the body of Christ, doesn't it? Uh, But not because we're under any principle of law, but because we're under the principle of grace. God so loved the world, right? God loved the world. They'll know you're Christians by your love, right? All right, so that's a quick background or quick, you know, refresher, if you will, to bring us up to speed for today. So we're going to look today just some general information at the beginning, Matthew 7, 13 through 23. So please turn there if you haven't. So here, Matthew 7, 13 through 23, let's read it quickly here. Enter through the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles are they. So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness." So, here's a 30,000-foot overview of what we're going to find in our passage in the session this morning. And uh, you'll see there in verses 13 through 14, he's going to introduce this issue of entry into the coming kingdom of heaven. And while the passage doesn't use the phrase, the content indicates that, in fact, that is the topic we're discussing Then if you look at verses 15 through 20, there's a warning from Christ about those who are false prophets, and Christ characterizes them in that passage as wolves in sheep's clothing. The last three verses in our passage are verses 21 through 23, and they return to the issue of entry into the kingdom. In actuality, though, all three parts of this passage are dealing with entry into the yet future kingdom of heaven where Christ will reign. Now remember that Jesus is offering the literal, physical, earthly kingdom that was promised by God and prophesied by the prophets to the Israelites. What, which Israelites? The Israelites living in the land at that time. Remember also that at the point, this point in Jesus' ministry, the nation has not yet finally rejected that offer of the kingdom. And we know that that's coming up. What chapter is that in? In chapter 12. So that's, that's ahead. So at this point in time, they're still expecting the kingdom to come, and Jesus is talking to them about that kingdom. So regarding Christ's earthly kingdom, you will recall that Revelation 20 says Christ will reign for a thousand years. It's that kingdom that is being referenced here in our passage. So again, in context, 
These verses are all addressed to Israelites living in the land of Israel, and the one speaking to them is their coming King and Messiah. Now, just as a quick side note, I found this interesting. You remember that when the wise men came from the east to Herod, after the birth of Jesus, they questioned Herod, and what did they ask? Where is he who is born King of the Jews? So isn't it interesting that from the very birth of Jesus, he was their coming king. And then now he's presenting himself as their coming king in these verses. I just thought that was rather interesting. All right, now let's mention this. Four gospels and two gospel messages in the New Testament. Now, everyone in here knows that there are four Gospels. The Gospel books are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But there are also two Gospel messages in the New Testament. And let's be very careful that we understand what we're saying because it's important to remember what the word Gospel means. The word Gospel means good news. And it can refer to that expression, good news or gospel. It can refer to either the gospel books themselves, but it can also refer to the message of the gospel in those books. So the gospels, we could say, contain the gospel. You with me still? Have I lost you? I hope not. All right, so continuing in this mindset here, let's think about this for a moment. The two gospel messages in the New Testament are, number one, the gospel of the kingdom, which was specifically directed to the Jews and was the good news preached by John the Baptist, Jesus, and the Twelve. Um, there, and you can see the scriptures that I have listed for you there. And then the second gospel is the gospel of substitution, or what we would call the gospel of the cross which is for both Jews and Gentiles, and was the good news preached by the Twelve and the Apostle Paul after the resurrection of Christ. So again, there are two Gospels that the New Testament presents, but it's interesting that even though we say there are two Gospels presented, both of these Gospel messages are revealed in the Old Testament also. They start in Genesis and continue through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and on into the book of Acts. In our passage here, Jesus is presenting the gospel or the good news of the kingdom to the Israelites. And notice that he presents three hazards. Did you get that when we read the passage? One is there is a wide gate, which could just as well be called the false gate. And then there's the false prophets who Jesus calls wolves in sheep's clothing. And finally, there is a false attempt at entry by, I'm going to use this expression, fast-talking individuals who think that they can talk their way into the kingdom. And they want to know why they can't, or Jesus is going to point that out, why they can't do that. So that's a quick overview again. Let's break it down. So in the passage, let's start with verse 13 and 14 here. It's worth pointing out that the words narrow here in this passage are actually two different Greek words. And, they, and then also that the words destruction and life each have a definite article before the nouns in the Greek. Well, Jim, that's just a bunch of gobbledygook. Well, stand by. I'm going to explain that for you here shortly. But I want to point it out right now. So look at the passage. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to, in the Greek, literally, the destruction. And there are many who enter through it, for the gate is small, and the way is narrow that leads to what life? The life, and there are few who find it. So if we think about the narrow and the wide gates, it's vitally important that we keep things in their proper context. And it's very, very important in the book of Matthew. So the narrow and the wide gates in context, both are referring to, be sure you get this, to the entry of the Israelites 
into the coming kingdom in which Christ will reign. That's very important. One gate provides access. The other gate prevents access. And that is the way that Jesus is presenting this topic here. All right. Even though the narrow gate is the singular way to kingdom life, notice that it is a deliberate considered intentional decision to enter it. An Israelite cannot accidentally enter the narrow gate. Notice that Jesus repeats the word narrow twice in that passage for emphasis. And notice also that, I mentioned this before, the Greek word translated narrow is highlighted. And here's what that word literally means in verse 14. It means to be pressed by tribulation and affliction. So Jesus is warning his Jewish audience that the entry by means of the narrow gate, while being the only right choice, of necessity, get this now, brings with it tribulation and affliction. This is reminiscent of the warning about persecution that Christ gave to his audience in Matthew 5, 10 through 12, which says, Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the what? Kingdom of heaven, Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So entering the narrow gate will provide, involve rather tribulation, affliction, and persecution, but it's still the right gate. And this is really an important concept, not only for Jesus' Israelite audience, but it's also very important for us. Why? Because tribulation and affliction does not automatically mean that one has taken the wrong path. I hope you heard that correctly. In fact, tribulation and affliction may be God's clear sign that we've taken the right path. Isn't that interesting? That's a wonderful thought, right? We all can't wait for that. We who are in the body of Christ can also suffer persecution. Paul writes to Timothy and says here, 2 Timothy 3, 12, look what he says here, Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So trials are certain to come. But this is important. Notice what I have in italics there. God has a purpose for it and in it. So when we encounter trials, our attitude as believers should not be to accuse God and question His motives and purposes, but let's be honest, isn't that what we often do, right? My hand just went up. We come to God in frustration and sometimes in anger and we metaphorically shake our fist at God in heaven and we cry out in our hearts, if not vocally, God, what are you doing? Have you ever done that? This isn't what I signed up for. But hold on there, pilgrim, as John Wayne would say. Hold on there, pilgrim, right? That's exactly what we signed up for when we trusted in Christ. And when we chose godliness. And we must never, ever forget that God has a glorious purpose in it. Namely, that we might be conformed to the image of His Son. We say all the time, oh, make me more like Jesus. I just want to be more like Jesus. And God says, okay, here it comes. Trial, tribulation, persecution. Oh no, God, that's not what I wanted. What are you doing? Right? Isn't that how we typically respond? So, what's the moral here? Let's rejoice in the midst of tribulation, affliction, and persecution. Why would we want to do that? Because we know there are no accidental trials. All are for God's purpose and intent. And I wrote a note to myself here and said, someone needed to hear that today. I know I did. So, at least I got something out of that. All right, now, let's look at the passage here 
verse seven, uh, seven, chapter 7, 13 through 14, I have taken the liberty to expand the English here to better convey what is really being said. I'm not rewriting the Bible. There, that would bring a curse, so I'm not doing that. But let's see what we have here. You must enter into the kingdom through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it because it's easy to find, easy to get through, and quite popular, even though in the end it leads to utter disaster. For the gate is small and the way is constrained by affliction that leads to the kingdom of life of Messiah. And there are a relatively few who find that small, narrow, constrained gate because of the hard and difficult path that goes with choosing it. That sort of helps me understand that passage a little bit better. Now here's something that's very important to understand. Jesus is not a mix and match Messiah. He's not the world's idea of a Savior where you can pick and choose the kind of Jesus you want to follow. He's not the thumbs-up Jesus, is He? Jesus presented Himself to the people of Israel as the one and only Messiah. And the path of following Him meant entering the one singular narrow gate, period. Jesus presents Himself also in the Scripture as, notice, the way the truth, and the life. And that's the gospel of substitution. He died in our place. Let me expand on that here again. Look, I've expanded that passage. Jesus said, I, in contrast and distinction with everything else and everyone else, am the singular way. I am the singular truth. And I am the singular life. No one comes to the Father Except by me, he says. Wow. There's no other Savior. There's no other path to life. And notice what 1 Timothy 2, 5 says here. For there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So similarly, the path that Jesus is presenting here to the Israelites are not at all the same. And which gate is chosen does make a difference. It does matter. Which is why Jesus tells them, you must enter through the narrow gate. Now look at verses 15 through 20 here. Beware, well, let's look at fit verse 15, first of all. Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. And you'll notice I've highlighted the words them twice in this passage. And I'm doing that intentionally because people want to come to this passage and apply this to losing your salvation. They want to say, oh, well, you know, if you don't bear good fruit, blah, 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 blah. Well, wait a minute. We're in the book of Matthew, and Matthew is dealing with believing Jews, and he's writing this information to them to remind them that the Jesus they believed in is, in fact, the Messiah. And oh, by the way, it has nothing whatsoever to do with Gentiles. Was that clear enough? But people want to come to this passage, and they want to say, oh, see, you can lose your salvation because you're not bearing fruit. Baloney. That's absolute baloney. All right, so... Look what he says here. Jesus warned his Israelite audience. Make a note in your Bible. He warns his Israelite audience about the false prophets. In fact, Jesus is doing exactly the same thing that Moses had done some 14 centuries earlier. I have the passages listed there for you. Where Moses addressed in chapter 13 false prophets who were declaring something was going to happen and didn't. And in verse 18, Moses addressed the false prophets who led the Israelites away from God, which in our context here is a direct condemnation of the teachers of Pharisaic righteousness. Notice also that again Jesus called them wolves in sheep clothing. Isn't that interesting? Interesting. 
Continuing on in these verses, Jesus also introduces the fruit illustration to metaphorically emphasize an important point, namely how to identify false prophets, not how to identify unbelievers or believers who've lost their salvation. See me shaking my head? No, 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 no. He's dealing with false prophets. Can you read? It says false prophets, right? Okay, so... Very important point. So how can one tell who the wolves are? Because they're disguised as sheep. So how can you tell them from the real sheep? Right? These false prophets. The way to uncover the wolves among the flock, Israel, Israel, is to carefully inspect their wolf fruit, he says. Look at these verses again. Verse 16, you will know them by their fruits. And then the end there in verse 20, you will know them by their fruits. Very important. So Jesus points out that it's the source that determines the fruit. Just as good trees produce good fruit, so bad trees will produce bad fruit. Good and bad is determined by the fruit's source. So I think it's interesting that the law of Moses, this is just an aside note here, the law of Moses forbid the cutting down of good fruit trees. Did you know that? When they went into Canaan, they weren't allowed to cut down the good fruit trees. However, if there was a tree that wasn't producing fruit or produced bad fruit, it could be cut down. That's in Deuteronomy 20.20. 20. But what's the determ determining factor in whether or not they can be cut down or not? Well, obviously, it's the source. So now let's talk about the rest of the passage. Gates, wolves, sheep, and fruit. All right, so we're going to dig a little deeper into this, and here we go. False prophets, who are the wolves, will point an Israelite to the wrong gate, the wide one, and the wrong way, the broad one. Now just to make sure everyone's clear, who are we talking about here? We're talking about Israel, and specifically who are the ones that are leading them astray? It's the false prophets, okay? So again, very important that we keep this in mind. Very, very, very important. And look what he says here in verse 13 again. The gate is, the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to the destruction, and there are many who enter through it. So the false prophet will always point to the wrong gate. The false prophet will entice you, Israelites, to go his way. And he'll attempt to lure you with words like, Come join me. Let's go this way. After all, everybody else is. The false prophet will always point out all of the attractions to the wrong way and will appeal to your flesh. And sadly... His way may be very popular. And in fact, you may love it for a while. That is, until the hammer drops, as they say. Notice that there are many who enter the wrong gate. Many. Many who follow the wrong way, leading to destruction. And again, this is a reference to the Pharisees' teaching of Pharisaic righteousness. Jesus is addressing the Pharisees. Now, by contrast, a true prophet among them would point them to the narrow gate, the one that leads to life. There are a couple of very good questions that we could consider right here, and here they are. Will there be trouble and persecution associated with choosing the narrow gate? Well, we've already seen the answer to that, haven't we? Uh, yeah, you can count on it. Uh, will you sometimes question whether you picked the right path? Yeah, probably. But the question is, is it the right gate? The, narrow, the, the wide gate is not the right gate. Only the narrow gate. Important. False prophets will not only point people to the wrong gate, they themselves will end up going through them to their own destruction. You know the old saying, misery loves company. 
right? And they want to take as many people with them as they can. Here's an interesting point of comparison. Uh, false prophets, while a prominent theme in the Old Testament and on into the Gospels, because both the Old Testament and the Gospels are under the principle and rule of law. So we see false prophets mentioned there. The theme of false, false prophets, while not disappearing completely, does fade away as you move into the New Testament, especially in the epistles, and the church age, which is under the principle of grace, right? Right? What, do, what does become prominent in the New Testament epistles, whether by name or otherwise, is false teachers. So here in our passage today, the ones that Israel is being warned about in particular were what? False prophets and those who claim to speak for the Lord. But for us in the body of Christ, the primary, not the only, but the primary emphasis is not on false prophets, but rather on false teachers. Now, let's look at this. Peter had something to say about this. Look what he says. But false prophets also arose among the people. Who's he talking about? Israel. Just as there will also be, notice the contrast here, false teachers among you. Who's the you? It's the body of Christ. Who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, divisive teachings, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. Now, this is a really good question here. Uh, in what sense did Jesus buy the false teachers? Well, he paid for their sins with his own life, didn't he? For God so loved only those that he knew would come to Christ. It doesn't say that. For God so loved the world. That's everybody, folks. That's the adulterer, the homosexual. That's the thief, the robber. That's the, that's the you name it, right? And you know what? Before we came to Christ, we were all enemies of God, and we were under God's wrath. But God, in His great mercy, in which He loved us, sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made among flesh, that we might be saved. And isn't that wonderful to know? He paid for their sins with His life. By the way, let me just point out again, the word destruction in this passage is the same word used by Jesus regarding the wide gate in the passage we looked at earlier. So false teachers to fa false prophets rather to false teachers. Now we're currently in an age when the primary warning, as we said, is against false teachers who infiltrate the body of Christ. If you think about it, Peter wrote two letters that we have copies of, and 2 Peter 3, 17 through 18 are the last two verses of his second letter. Why do I even say that? Because if you're writing to someone knowing that it was either the last or near the last thing you would ever write, wouldn't you be concerned with writing about things that were the most important to you? the things that most concerned you. I think that's true. And so if that is true, let's keep that in mind as we read this passage. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard so that you are not carried away by the error of unprincipled men and fall from your own steadfastness. He didn't say fall from your salvation. Be very careful your steadfastness. But he says, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Wow. Carried away. Well, we have a choice. We can be carried away. But what's the alternative? Well, he tells us there in verse 18, doesn't, it? doesn't he? He says, if you don't want to be carried away, he says, grow. And that's an imperative. That's a command form. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, he says. Um, people, by the way, often try to pit the Apostle Peter against the Apostle Paul. But I want you to notice here what uh, the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 4.14. Look what he says here. Uh, As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed about here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness in deceitful scheming. 
No. But look at this. Paul's words here suggest that if we as believers are not vigilant, we too can in fact be carried away by false teachers. Not lose our salvation, but we can be carried away into error. Have you ever been carried away into error? Don't raise your hand. Can I tell you I have been carried away into error? I was carried away into error for almost 20 years until God, through His grace and mercy and love for me, said, enough is enough. Let me get you out of that and get you where you need to be. So yeah, this, these two passages are very, very important to me. Wow, God is good, isn't He? Notice how Peter's warning there in 2 Peter 3, 17 and 18 parallels the warning that Jesus is giving His Israelite audience in Matthew 7, 15 and verse 20. Both Peter and Jesus lay out alternative paths, but Peter, like Jesus, also makes it clear that we really don't have an option. We're either going to be carried away by error or, gr or grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. There is no middle ground. A very important question that we might want to ask ourselves here is, does Peter mean that believers are to merely grow in their information about Christ? Or is there more to it? Well, what, what Peter is actually saying is that we're to grow in our personal experiential knowledge. In other words, we are to grow in grace because grace is fundamental to God's character and should become fundamental to our character also. And this can only happen as we grow in our personal knowledge of Christ. The more we understand about Christ, the more we should become like Christ. Because we're new creations in Christ Jesus. Knowledge is not an end unto itself. But knowledge is essential in producing character. So let us grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If we look here at verses 21 through 23 here, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Now, verses 15 through 20 dealt with false prophets, false prophets. Now we're looking at verse 21 through 23, which deal with, watch this now, false followers. False followers. So be sure you keep that in mind as we continue here. There are two points of, of consideration here in verses 21 and 23. The first is the focus on the verbs, notice, do enter, say, know, and practice. And secondly, the ongoing and repeated theme introduced here and continuing to the final chapters in Matthew of the judgment of the Israelites to determine entry into the coming messianic kingdom. You see Matthew 25, 11, 12 there. Lord, Lord, open up for us, but he answered, truly I say to you, I do not know you. It's critically important to understand that as Jesus introduces this theme of the judgment of the Israelites in view of the coming messianic kingdom, they would have been, they would have been both shocked and stunned. Why would that be? Because it was a commonly held belief that entry into the coming kingdom was guaranteed to Israelites based upon their identity in Abraham. Now, you may recall that in a previous session we discussed the commonly held belief that came or comes from Jewish mythology that on the last day, Abraham would be standing at the gate of hell to make sure that no Jew ever entered. But here, Jesus warns them that in fact, they might not enter the kingdom. 
Shocking. Absolutely shocking. Remember that Jesus had warned them earlier in Matthew 5.20 where it says, For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees. What? How, how would that ever work? How could I ever do that? They're the, they're the top rung of the ladder. But they really weren't. But Jesus says, that, well, if your righteousness doesn't surpass them, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Gasp. Astonishment. Also in Matthew 7, 13 and 14, which we just we read, says there are many who will enter which gate? They're going to enter the broad gate, the gate of destruction. What? But I'm a Jew. For Jesus' Israelite audience, this was astonishingly, or astonishing, and it was really shocking. And not only that, it was even dread, it was dreadful information. We talked about that. How could I ever live up to or surpass the Pharisees in their righteousness? Well, of course, the point Jesus was trying to make is you can't. I'm the only way. I'm the narrow gate, Jesus is saying. The judgment of the Israelites that Jesus is talking about, of course, will take place uh, at the time of his second coming. And as we proceed in our study, we're going to find out or encounter additional revelation concerning that particular judgment. So let's keep going here. You ever heard the expression, he can sell ice cubes to Eskimos? How about this other one? He can talk the hind leg off the donkey. Do you see that three-legged donkey right there? Wow. I don't know how he's riding it. Yeah. Um, as surprising as it may seem, in Matthew 7, 21 through 23, Jesus indicates that there will be those who will actually attempt to persuade him to grant them entry into the kingdom. Notice what it says here. Matthew, many will say to me on that day, not a few, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons? And in your name perform many miracles? But we see in this passage that verbal eloquence and the most persuasive speech will not carry any weight in the coming judgment of the Israelites. And for the Israelite hoping to enter the kingdom in which Christ reigns, just talking a good talk will mean absolutely nothing. In context, for the Israelite to whom Jesus was then speaking, doing the Father's will would have meant manifesting the true righteousness expressed in the law of Moses as opposed to Pharisaic righteousness. Remember again, Jesus had warned them, we just read it, that their righteousness had to surpass that of the scribes and the Pharisees. Notice also that those who will enter the kingdom of heaven will be those whom Christ knows. Did you notice that? The ultimate question Jesus introduces to his Jewish audience, but also to us, is, do I know you? Do I know you? It's not how impressive the things that you claim to do are, but does Jesus know you? The deceived Israelites that Jesus is addressing in these verses will, will, will call Christ Lord, Lord. Remember that in Hebrew, when they want to emphasize something, it's repeated two or three times. Yeah, Lord, you're, you're the Lord, you're the Lord, Lord. And here it's expressing an acknowledgement of Christ's ultimate lordship. They're going to recognize that. And that appears again in Matthew chapter 25. I have it right there on the screen. But again, notice also, even in this passage, Matthew 25, 11, and 12 there, that the criteria, once again, for entry into the kingdom is, does Jesus know you? Does Jesus know you? The deceived Israelites are going to make impressive claims to have prophesied, cast out demons, and performed miracles in Christ's name. What could be better than that? 
But there's no indication here that Christ is impressed with their claims. Notice what Dr. Fruchtenbaum wrote about this passage. He says, one can truly be saved and never perform a miracle, yet enter, yet enter, uh, and, and yet enter the kingdom. While many others who have done miracles in the name of a counterfeit Jesus will see themselves left out of the messianic kingdom. Notice what Yeshua said to those people who even did miracles in his name. Jesus does not say, I used to know you, but you lost your salvation, so I don't know you any longer. Rather, he said, I never knew you. Miracles are possible in the name of a counterfeit Yeshua because Satan can duplicate many of the miracles of Jesus. Just because these people claim to have done things in the name of Yeshua does not necessarily make it true. They had outward profession, but Jesus said, I never knew you, and that clearly means they were never saved to begin with. Dr. Constable says something similar. He says, obviously, it was possible for unbelieving disciples, think Judas Iscariot, to prophesy, to exercise demons, and perform miracles in Jesus' name. It's just mind-boggling to stop and think about the fact that, G that Judas was going around with the eleven, doing the very same things they were doing. And yet he wasn't a believer. The authority of Christ's name, he says here, the authority of his name, his person, enabled them to do so, not their own righteousness or their own relationship to him. Many onlookers undoubtedly viewed these works as good fruit and evidence of righteous character. However, these were cases of tares that looked like wheat, he says. Acts 19, 13 uh, through 15. Notice here we have a great example of what, uh, of what they were saying. But also some of the Jewish exorcists who went from place to place attempted to name over those who had the evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, I adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches, and seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, we're doing this and apparently having some success at it. And the evil spirit answered in this instance and said to them, I recognize Jesus and I know about Paul, but who are you? And the rest of the story doesn't go very well for them. Very interesting, isn't it? All right, let's wrap this up, shall we? Concluding statements. In verses 13 and 14 and in verses 21 and 23, we see Jesus talking about kingdom entry and that entry into the messianic or entry into the messianic kingdom. And both passages talk about the many, the majority of those who come to the place of potential entry into the kingdom, the messianic kingdom will be turned away, Jesus says. Jesus declares that relatively few Israelites will be granted entry into Christ's coming kingdom, but that those who are will be granted entry because Christ actually knows them. So Jewish entry into Christ's coming messianic kingdom is not about Pharisaic righteousness or the working of signs and wonders but it's a matter of true righteousness. Now, be careful, watch this. As revealed in the law of Moses and as taught by John the Baptist and Jesus. Now, what was the purpose of true righteousness being taught under the law? It was to direct the Israelites to the understanding that they cannot reach God through the law. It was pointing them to the coming Messiah. And that's... That's what I say here. This understanding would lead the Israelites, that is an understanding of true righteousness, would lead the Israelites to Jesus himself. Jesus, the narrow gate and the narrow path, the only one that leads to life. These Israelites will be those whom the Messiah knows and will subsequently grant entry into that kingdom. Similarly, we in the body of Christ certainly are to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And while knowing Christ is of immense importance, 
we too must be known by him to be saved. In other words, one must have an established relationship with Christ. Here's the really good news. This happens the moment we believe in Jesus for the safekeeping of our souls. In that instant, we now have a relationship, an established relationship with him. At that moment, we're made new creatures in Christ. We're, we are as newborn spiritual babies with the full capacity for everything that Abba Father has and wants for us. But just like physical babies, we learn that we have to maintain fellowship with Abba Father through the process of growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. The relationship comes first, then the fellowship. Through the initial establishment of the relationship, at the point of belief, Jesus knows us. And He identifies with us. And He claims us as His own. Isn't that wonderful? Notice Galatians 4, 9. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, when you placed your trust in Christ, instantly you were known by God. John 10, 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, Jesus says. Are you one of Jesus' sheep? If you are, don't despair. It doesn't make any difference what you're going through in your life. Don't despair. He knows you. He says, you're my sheep. And I know you. We have relationship with Christ because He knows us. We have fellowship with Him because we are His sheep. And God's intent for us is that we should grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, so that our fellowship, watch this carefully, might be sweeter and sweeter, increasing in intimacy and glory. For believers, this, this process, taking advantage of this, is a foretaste, a foretaste of that which is to come and what will last for all eternity, namely, ongoing never-ending, increasing intimacy with Abba Father. That's something I am eagerly looking forward to. Are you? Let's pray. Abba Father, we thank you for your word, your truth that you've laid out for us today. We thank you for making a grace way which is far better than anything the law can provide. A grace way whereby you may know us and we in turn may grow in the knowledge of your Son and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's all about grace. Your relentless, wondrous, marvelous grace. Help us to indeed be consistently growing in this grace until we see you face to face. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Maranatha and God's people said, Amen and Amen. Thank you. God bless you. You got a couple extra.